Hello and welcome to video number 15. In this video, we're looking at a frictionless table and now there are three masses. So there's a mass in the middle, there's a mass on the right over a pulley, and there's a mass on the left over a pulley. Now what's a little different with this problem is we actually have two tensions. We have the tension between mass 1 and mass 2 and the tension between mass 2 and mass 3. Now tension 1 is going to be the same magnitude force acting on object 2 as it is on object 1, just different directions. Similarly, tension 2 is going to have the same magnitude of a force on M3 and M2, but different directions. Now T1 and T2 probably aren't the same. They can be, but generally they're not. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the acceleration of the system. We're going to figure out T1, T2, and then we're going to look at limiting cases. So what happens if M1 gets really big? What happens if M3 gets really big? And what happens if M2 gets really small, like zero? So what we want to do, like with most of these problems, is we want to pick a direction of acceleration that's positive. So we want to set up a reference frame. And the reference frame I'm going to pick is the clockwise direction. So you want to think about this like a train. All of these masses move in a clockwise direction around this track, if you will. It's not really a track. Um, that's the positive direction. So when we draw free body diagrams for each of these, we can imagine that it's in a line. So let's draw a free body diagram for object number one, M1. And for this object, we have a tension going to the right. That's T1. We have a tension, I'm sorry, not a tension. We have a mass times G, or a weight force, going to the left. So that's going to be M1G. Again, by left, we mean the negative direction, or counterclockwise. For object number two, we also have two forces. This time it's going to be tension 2 going to the right and tension 1 going to the left. There is no weight force. At least there's no weight force in the uh, direction of motion. Sure, there's a weight force here, but that's balanced by a normal force going up. And we know that because the object isn't going up or going down. So we're just concerning ourselves with the direction around uh, the system clockwise. But this is a three object system, so we actually need to draw a third free body diagram. So this third object is going to have a force in the positive direction of the weight force, M3G, and it's going to have a force in the negative direction of T2. It's important that you keep your subscripts uh, straight. It's very easy to mix things up as you get more and more and more objects. So let's draw our, let's write our equations of motion. The net force on object 1 has two definitions. On the one hand, you add up the forces. So T1 minus M1G. Minus, we can tell because of the free body diagram. And that's going to equal M1A. For the middle object, we're going to get T2 minus T1 equals M to A. And for the third object, we're going to get M3G minus T2 equals M3A. As always, don't get hung up on the fact that this weight force is positive. It's positive because the direction we've chosen to be positive is actually down over here or to the right over here. Now, this is where most of the physics happens up to this point. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of uh, algebra. So we need to solve in such a way that we're going to get rid of the unknowns. So there are actually multiple things we don't know. We don't know T1. We don't know A. We don't know T2. So what are we going to do? Well, we want to reduce the number of variables, and there are many ways to do this. But one of those ways is to take one of the equations. I'm going to start with this first one, and I'm going to try to make the T disappear. What I mean by that is I'm going to solve for t only in terms of a, which is one variable we don't know, and other stuff that we will know, like m1 and m2. So if I solve for t1, t1 is going to equal m1a plus m1g. Now there's a t1 over here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this t1 and I'm going to plug it in for T1 in our second equation of motion. 
So it's going to go in here. T2 stays for now. And that's going to be minus, instead of T1, I'm going to do M1A plus M1G because those are equivalent. So minus M1A minus M1G, and that's going to equal M2A. We'll just move this to give ourselves just a little breathing room. So now I'm going to solve this for T2. I'm going to bring the M2As already on the right, and then we're going to bring over this term and this term, and I'm going to get M2A plus M1A when I bring over that negative, plus M1G, and we now have an expression for T2, which is only in terms of things we know, and A, the one variable that we're solving for. But we still have T2 in this third equation, so we're going to plug this in here, and we're going to play the same game, M3G minus, so instead of T2, it's going to be minus M2A minus M1A minus M1G equals M3A. I know that's a mouthful of algebra. But we really are trying to get rid of variables one at a time. And the more objects you have, the more steps there are. So the next step I like to do is I like to group terms that have acceleration in them and terms that have acceleration due to gravity or g in them. So let's keep the g on the left here. So when I only write the g's, we have m3g. That's an a, that's an a. Oh, here's a g. Minus m1g is going to equal. Now on the right side we want to have the A's. So we already have M3A, so I'm going to bring this over, plus M2A plus M1A. And I'm almost done. There's nothing wrong with this, but we don't have A by itself. What I like to do to both sides is I like to factor out uh, the masses if I can, or in this case the G and the A. So I'm going to take this G out and I'm going to get M3 minus M1. See how I factored that out? On this side, I'm going to factor the A out, and I'm going to be left with M1 plus M2 plus M3. So M1 plus M2 plus M3 equals A. And then finally, the fun step is solving for A. You're just going to divide by all of this. So we're going to get that A equals M3 minus M1 over m1 plus m2 plus m3 times g. Again, I like to write it as some factor of g. So you're going to get some fraction of the acceleration due to gravity. The biggest you can do is g. The smallest you can do is uh, 0. So we start looking at this. We start saying, well, does this make sense? Well, if we look at this as let me use a different color, purple. A equals F net over M. Well, if this is the acceleration of the system, this is going to be the mass of the system, the net force in the system. Well, M1 plus M2 plus M3 is the mass of the system. It's sort of like a three-car train. You're accelerating all three masses. Now, the force you get to do that is going to be M3G, so M3 times G. That's this going down in the positive direction. So the weight force of this is pulling you in the positive direction and the weight force of M1 is pulling you in the negative direction. So to skip over questions B and C for just one moment, if M1 is much greater than M3, so if this mass, the one on the right, is much bigger, you're going to have the train accelerate to the right. You're going to have these objects accelerate clockwise. If, on the other hand, M1 was bigger, so if this is bigger, you're going to accelerate this way. You'll get a negative acceleration, and you see that. If M1 is bigger than M3, you get a negative number on the top, and you get a negative acceleration. The other interesting question is, what happens if M2 is 0? If that's the case, if M2 is 0, what the acceleration simplifies to is just M3 minus M1 over M1 plus m3 times g. This, if you remember, is actually 
the acceleration for an Atwood machine. When you get this mass down to zero, it really doesn't look any different than an Atwood machine, and these tensions will also become, uh, become similar. Now, solving back for the tensions, uh, if I want to solve for tension 1, tension 1 is going to equal M1A plus M1G. So when I rewrite M1A, I'm going to take this and put it over here. So I'm going to put the G first times that stuff. M3 minus M1 over M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M1G. And if I factor this out, I know you guys don't like when I do that, uh, but when I factor that out, what you get is you get M1G times some fraction. So M3 minus M1 over M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus 1. So you get tension 1 is some fraction of the weight force of object number 1. Similarly, tension 2 um, we could get by taking this equation over here and saying that, well, tension 2 is the same as tension 1 plus M2A. So what that's going to say is that's going to be tension 1, so it's going to be this plus, and because we're going to run out of time in the video here, I'm going to go pretty quickly, the uh, tension 1 is like this. It's just going to add one additional term, M2 times a. So you're going to get M1G times M3 minus M1 over M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus 1 plus M2 times G. I'm going to put the G over here times this stuff, M3 minus M1 over M1 plus M2 plus M3. So this big long thing would be the equation for tension uh, 2. And whether or not it's bigger is going to depend on um, the acceleration of the system, which is going to depend on the, uh, the masses. So again, when we do this kind of problem, when we find the acceleration of the system, we use the same strategy we've been using for all of these problems. You want to identify the direction of positive acceleration, in this case clockwise. You want to draw a free body diagram for each of the three objects. You want to write Newton's second law to get the equation of motion for each of the three objects. And then you're going to have to do some algebra to eliminate variables. Usually, you solve for the acceleration first. And then once you have that acceleration, you can solve for the tensions. It's a good idea to look at limiting behaviors. So you want to see what happens if one of the masses gets really big, if one of the masses gets really small, and sometimes what happens if they uh, get to be zero. So with a problem like this, we checked, and if M3 gets really big, you get an acceleration that's very positive to the right. If M1 is very big, you get an acceleration that's very negative to the left. But notice that acceleration can never get uh, bigger than G or more negative than negative G. So you want to look at this problem closely and you want to look at the other problems closely that are frictionless because the next level of problem that we're going to be looking at is we're going to take these very same problems, this flat table, a table at an incline, and we're going to add friction to it. And what's going to happen is there's just going to be one additional term for each of the free body diagrams. But you want to make sure you understand this process and you want to practice. And as always, I hope that this was useful.